Hello, I'm Keith Mestrich, CEO of Amalgamated Bank, and you're listening to Rise Radio. Hello, and welcome to Rise Radio. I'm your host, Kate Christensen. Rise is a global community of entrepreneurs and innovators who are working together with Barclays to create the future of financial services. We're curious about what's new in tech and what it means for the future of money. In this podcast, we will explore and explain how these emerging technologies work and what they mean for the future of banking, straight from the mouths of the people who are trying to disrupt the industry. Happy New Year! I recently sat down with Keith Mestrich, CEO of Amalgamated Bank. They're a small, privately held bank and are among the most radical financial institutions in the United States. They're not shy about pursuing their agenda of social progressivism and untraditional transparency. Amalgamated Bank is in an interesting position at this point in history. Their small size and private ownership means they're much nimbler than the big banks, but they also carry with them nearly a century of legacy that they're trying to honor and figure out how to use in a way that propels them forward rather than weighs them down in this increasingly virtual and digital financial era. Keith, it is such a treat to have you here on the show. To kick off with security questions, what is your favorite financial regulation? My favorite financial regulation is the Community Reinvestment Act because it makes sure that institutions like ours are making sure that all of our dollars don't go just to the wealthy, that we put resources into low and moderate income neighborhoods. Got it. And what is your favorite financial app on your phone besides the Amalgamated Bank app? Uh, I probably like Venmo. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. Do you usually pay with emojis? I usually transfer money to my kids and usually get something back with a lot of emojis on it. But I, I am known to use an emoji here and there. Yeah, usually just it's the, the stack of cash with wings flying away. Exactly, because that's exactly what it means to have kids. Yeah. <laughs> love it, love it. Could you tell us a bit about Amalgamated Bank? Sure. And um, when you joined, what your background is and your mission? Sure, so there's three questions in there. The Amalgamated Bank not quite as old as Barclays, but been around for 93 years. Started in the 20s by a labor union called the Amalgamated Clothing Workers. The mission of the bank at that time is not all that different from the mission today, but it was a a bank to provide financial services to working people in New York City. Banking at that time was pretty much the purview of the rich. So our bank had the first free savings accounts for workers, the first unsecured lines of credit, so somebody could send a kid to school or buy a small business, start a small business. And we essentially invented the foreign remittance system so that immigrant workers who are working in the clothing industry could send money back to their families in Europe. We've evolved since that time to continue offering services to working people in New York, but we've really become a financial partner for the broader progressive community around the country. Our our clients now include uh, unions, union pension funds, but also advocacy groups, nonprofit organizations, philanthropies, the Democratic Party, and similar kinds of organizations. Your tagline is to be the progressive bank for the progressive community. You advocate for and even bank a lot of controversial people and causes, Hillary Clinton's campaign, the DNC, organized labor, and minimum wage advocacy groups among them. In an era where people hear these names or issues and immediately retreat to the battle posts of their opinions, do you attempt to depoliticize the way in which you advocate for these groups and causes? So we like to think of ourselves as the bank that helps people who are doing good do a little bit better. So we're agnostic on many of the issues of the day, but are passionate about helping our clients. So if our clients are working on representing workers to have more power in the workplace, by providing them with better financial tools, we let them do that job just a little bit better. If it's we make a loan to them that allows them to amplify what they do, that's great. If we save them a little money because we're just a little bit cheaper on banking services, that's great. If we can take challenges that they have and put together some bespoke product that allows them to meet those challenges, that's fantastic. That applies for our union partners, our human needs delivery clients, those who are working on reproductive rights, helping save the environment. There's things that we can do in all of those. So those issues are inherently political, and we are kind of an inherently political bank. You don't become the bank of one party and not the other party. You don't become the bank of those organizations if people don't feel like you are with them. 
And mm-hmm. so many of our bankers come out of the traditional financial services industry, but many of our bankers come out of that community and understand, maybe sometimes better than they understand banking, the culture and needs of our client organizations. And so we are really able to help propel those, the missions of our clients forward in a really compelling way. Can you talk a bit more about the people who work at your bank? Because you don't have a traditional financial services background. Usually the rap sheet of a bank CEO, at least in the U.S., involves um, kind of a hopscotch around different Wall Street firms. Starting in B school and then moving through (laughs) the various big banks. Yeah. So what's it like culturally to blend people who come from a community organizing background and activism background and traditional financial services? Sure. So a few years ago, the Washington Post did a profile on me when I started at the bank in Washington, D.C., and my kids have never let me live down uh, how the Post characterized my sort of strange career trajectory to get into the banking. They called me the most unconventional banker on K Street. (laughs) And so I've had to live that down with my kids ever since then. But it's really true. I I spent uh, 27 years working in various positions in the labor movement and political advocacy. About midway through my career, I moved from the programmatic side of that work to really doing finance and administration work um, there to help those organizations just do what they do better. And that's very much what I feel like I do at the bank now. And we've collected a group of people who come from the communities where our customers do their work. So we have somebody who comes out of the environmental community where he spent years working on climate change issues. We have the head of our business development operation was a political fundraiser. Hmm. Um, Well, who better to you know, help build our business and someone who's very comfortable asking people to give money, yeah. right, to a, to an organization. We have um, people who've come out of the world of politics and, and nonprofits. That's not all of the people who work at the bank. Most of the people who work at the bank got traditional training in finance or mm-hmm. banking or whatever. But the marriage of those two people really allow sometimes creates friction and weird issues in the in the bank because you're trying to bring the cultural sensitivities of our customers together with the real need to provide less risky financial services. So sometimes those cultures clash a little bit, but I really think at the end of the day, what it does is it allows us to speak with a very, very different voice for our niche of customers that nobody, no other bank in the country is really targeting that group that I just described. And I don't think anybody could really do it if they didn't have the collection of bankers that we've been able to assemble. I'd like to shift the conversation more towards identity and banking. In a recent article that you wrote for the Huffington Post, you pointed out that New York City has made a large effort to provide municipal ID cards to over half a million of its residents who were lacking other forms of identification. But still, the biggest banks in our city and the rest of the nation are unwilling to use that as a proper form of identification for banking services. What is your vision for the future of identity in financial services? So I I think we in the financial services community need to embrace that initial mission of the amalgamated bank, which is banking is, let me start it this way, not having a bank account in this country is a really, really big challenge. It makes it really hard to do, to cash a check, cash your paycheck. You can't partake in direct deposit because there's no place to directly deposit it to. So oftentimes you're subject to having to pay additional fees to a check cashing company who's going to take a little bit more out of it than a traditional financial institution would. You have a hard time paying your bills, right, because you can't write a check and put it in the mail. You have to go to the post office and get a mail order, or you have to go to the electric company to pay the bill. You can't pay it online because you don't have a a traditional account. And you can't participate in the sort of wonders of e-commerce because if you don't have a bank account, you can't get a debit card, you can't get a credit card, and you can't take advantage of the fact that you can have Amazon Prime send things right to your home the next day. You can't take advantage of the tremendous deals that you don't have. There's a high correlation between people who don't have bank accounts and people who live in places like food deserts, so you can't take advantage of the ability to order online. So. The vision really is, I think, in terms of democratizing as much as we can the availability of financial services, we should do it because it helps empower people in all kinds of ways in their lives. So part of that is trying to recognize that since the 2001, September 11th, 2001, tragedies. The regulators, for good reason, have wanted to make sure that we don't facilitate money laundering or terrorist financing and have really clamped down on making sure that we know who our customers are. You need to then make sure that people have alternative ways to prove who they are. So I think 
our being the first bank in the city to take the municipal ID, which allowed many immigrant workers and others to get the first ID that they ever had, was a way of achieving that democratization. On the topic of credit and how it relates to identity, I was at a conference last month where I met someone who runs the show at an e-commerce retailer that sells very trendy, fast fashion apparel. One of the issues his company is facing right now revolves around credit. Their customer base includes a large, if not majority, contingent of teenagers and young adults who pay with debit cards. They either don't have or don't like to use credit cards, which means that every order hits their bank account immediately. And this is a problem because with e-commerce in general, people like to order more styles and sizes than they plan to keep. That's the peril of not being able to try things on in a dressing room or feel them you know, on a rack or shelf. And so the customer in this case has to scale back their order since they don't have the credit to accommodate extras and it's money that they lose immediately and don't get refunded for like 14 days post return. That in turn hurts the retailer because customers are more tentative with what they buy and they miss out on the potential extra spend of this population. Are you guys thinking about alternative means of credit for non-consumers right now? So credit's a dual-edged sword. A lot of people use it badly. And you would not want to do anything that I think encouraged people to get deeper in debt and, and, and other things. So I think any extension of credit needs to come with a responsibility to help people learn how to use it appropriately. Having said that, credit can also be a powerful tool of economic propulsion, both for consumers to be able to advance money when they don't quite have it yet, when they get paid on Friday, they want to buy something today, and we'll use it responsibly. And exactly, credit is a way that we've always been able to inject into our economy greater buying power for people to be able to do things. We've got to get that balance down, right? But as we think about extending commercial depository services, checking and savings accounts, we also think about concurrently how do we accompany that with a credit product so that people can take the resources that they have and use them in the most effective means that they can. Same for small businesses, same for medium-sized businesses. To the extent that you can borrow funds to be able to put them towards economic use, it's great, but we do have a responsibility to make sure that people do it responsibly. One of the founding premises of your bank was to help individuals send money to their families abroad. We had the U.S. head of TransferWise on Rise Radio recently to talk shop about disruption in remittance payment services of traditional banks. So as technologies like TransferWise come forth and make services like remittances cheaper and more accessible, what will remain the core competencies of banks like Amalgamated? So let's unpack that a little bit. Remittance is incredibly important. When our bank was founded, people had left war-torn Europe. Um, there were no jobs left there. The continent was rebuilding. They came to America to have a moment to find a job and start a, start a new life. An important piece of that was they needed a way to send money back home, either to put, just let their families not live in poverty where they were, or oftentimes to make the trek across the ocean to come here themselves. Mm-hmm. That was an important thing that we helped solve, that system didn't exist in the 20s. A few banks like ours worked with a few banks in Europe and some of the political parties in Europe to figure out a way to actually make that happen. Well, it's happening today as well. And maybe we don't send as much money back to Ireland and Poland and other places, but we send it to Latin America and Asia and to, you know, immigrant families that are, are still coming from places in Europe. And part of it, too, is like the nomad economy with Airbnb and gig jobs. People also just can work new places. Absolutely. So there's a tremendous need to be able to figure out how to do this. Again, since September 11th, there's been a lot of crackdown on banks or on the use of the banking system to send money overseas in ways that may be inappropriate. So the regulators, again, oftentimes for good reason, have made it harder for traditional financial institutions to do this. And the disruptors like TransferWise have come onto the scene and helped figure out how to do some of this faster, better, in ways that the traditional financial services industries have kind of gotten stuck in terms of doing this. I think that's what's going to happen in so many of the things in our industry. You're going to take traditional financial institutions who will be sort of the hub, and they will partner with lots of other organizations who figure out how to do things with a better customer service interface, with you know faster processes, and ways that take some of the tricky things that financial institutions haven't been able to figure out how to get around. 
by using good entrepreneurial intuition and technique, they'll figure out how to do it. So I think banks will often become a hub. They'll have many fintech partners who will provide different kinds of services for them. Your footprint is focused on three U.S. cities, but going forward, you're focusing on digital. What are your thoughts on digital banks like Simple, Atom, and Mondo, and what does competition look like for banks like yours who have both brick and mortar and digital presences versus the purely virtual digital banks? So there's a lot of controversy around this. I come down firmly in the camp that brick and mortar banking is significantly on the decline, that more and more transactions will be conducted digitally, that there'll be some need for people to have a brick and mortar facility to go into, but it'll, that will be provided by fewer and fewer financial institutions. And at some point in the future, probably much sooner than any of us think, most people will conduct their financial transactions 100% digitally. With yeah. emojis. With, with, with emojis, yeah. right? Flying money and, and, and smiley faces. I absolutely believe that that's going to happen. We're taking our bank in that direction very much. We are reducing our geographic footprint, but we, at the same time, think much more about a national audience as we can provide services to that progressive group of individuals who would like to bank with a bank that has the kinds of values that we have. We think that people, just like they seek out free trade coffee, want to seek out a bank that helps you know people who are doing good do better. So we are putting a lot of resources into developing a digital platform that will allow people to find us and to bank with us. You mentioned fair trade coffee. Transparency is becoming more and more top of mind as a value people seek out in the entities with which they do business, whether it's where their coffee beans are harvested, clothing manufactured, or even the internal ethics of companies in which they invest. What do you think are the near-term and long-term gains to be made with transparency in the realm of financial services? So I think for most consumers, people have always felt that banking has been pretty opaque. They didn't really quite yeah. understand how do banks exactly make money, how much are they making off of me, a, a bunch of other things. I think we have an obligation to our customers to be much more transparent and talking to people about what our margins are and, and how we actually derive a profit. So one of the approaches that we're going to take is we are going to tell, our, we are going to work with our commercial customers who have membership bases. We are going to say to those customers, here's how much money we make on your deposits. And we have a value proposition for you, which is we're going to share a portion of it with you. And we're going to share a portion with you. And we're going to share a portion with that membership organization so that you're part of. And we're going to be pretty clear. We get this much. They get this much. You get this much. And I, it, it is. But I think that a lot of people will appreciate that and will say, I, now I kind of know how every bank makes money. And they didn't tell me, but looks like they're keeping a little bit more for themselves than they're giving to me and the organizations that I support. So we're going to try it and we're going to see, does it actually give us a competitive advantage or not? What's the reaction been so far? Have you had like one of the labor organizations you bank respond in a really surprising way of I had no clue that we could even understand this process or that we were legally allowed to. So it's a revenue sharing model, and the revenue sharing models have been in the financial services industries, particularly credit cards and, and, and other things for some time. We have had some very preliminary conversations with some of our organizations. We will launch a couple of pilots in mid-January with the hope of having eight to 10 of these up by the end of the second quarter of next year. So we'll have to come back, and I'll tell you much more coherently what the reaction from the customer base has been. But we're hopeful that it will be good. Yeah. I mean, I think it's one of those things where you don't expect transparency from something. I don't expect my bank to tell me exactly how they're using my money and where it's going back. But when you step back from it, I expect that from the clothes that I wear and from the food I consume. So why not? And increasingly, we see it more and more. People want to know if there's GMOs in their food or not. They want to know how much sugar is in their food. I mean, I think a lot of people love these calorie count things when you go into a restaurant so you can see how many calories there are. Now when you go in one that doesn't have it, it's like, I wish I would, <laughs> somebody would tell me how many you know, calories were in that Big Mac or whatever it is yeah. that I was going to eat. So I think there's an increasing demand for transparency sort of in all corners of our lives. People don't like this this, this reaction on fake news that we've had, mm -hmm. right? It's just making people really angry, right? That yeah. there are people out there that are pretending to be something they're not. So I think consumers have a greater and greater demand for transparency all the time. I'm excited to see where this trend takes us. Yeah, me too. What do you see as the paths of least resistance for providing financial services to the un- and underbanked? 
Yeah, it's really hard. You know, there's a reason there's underbanked areas are underbanked, and, and partly because there's not a lot of wealth in those in, in those communities, and it's very hard to take the traditional brick and mortar model of putting a retail branch in an area like that and make it work. And I imagine also to build trust and compete with institutions like payday loans and absolutely those institutions serve a real need. They get dollars quickly into the hands of people who need them. If you're if you're a a family suffering in in poverty and your refrigerator goes out and you have three kids, you got to get a new refrigerator. So a payday lender on the corner looks pretty enticing as opposed to not being able to keep you know, the milk cold enough so that uh, your, your kids can drink it. So it's not like they don't serve a need, and they do it a lot quicker than a traditional financial institution would. We've got a handful of branches in historically underbanked areas um, around New York City. It has been very difficult to make those branches work. They work in part because we have a partnership with the city and state to put some deposit dollars into those communities. Um, but it's it's hard. I think that there are a lot of people in the fintech space using technology to try and solve this problem. Companies like B or Simple or others that can provide banking services to people so that they aren't reliant on having to go to a bank branch but can use their phone or a prepaid card or a a debit card are potentially wonderful means to try and figure that out. What would a productive experimental environment look like for providing more effective, less predatory financial services for un- and underbanked populations? So I think the, a bunch of things, right? One is banks and other financial institutions just have to decide that their traditional revenue model is not going to work if you're trying to provide banking services to historically underbanked people. They're not going to carry large balances, so there's not a lot to be made off the balances. It's really unfair to charge exorbitant fees, such as overdraft fees and other things. So you have to have a banking model that incorporates being able to provide underbanked or unbanked services in a bigger set of financial products. And people are just going to have to accept that not every account that they have will generate the same return the best accounts that we have um, will do. And we need support from the regulators, I think, to compel people to actually do that and to propel people to do that. Otherwise, I don't think think it happens. So it's got to be a real partnership where financial institutions recognize that this is an important public service that they must provide, given the fact that they have the ability to do very well in a bunch of other corners of their lives. We need to have regulators that, I think, push it in ways that they do a pretty good job on in terms of pushing credit into low and moderate income areas, a pretty good job. They could think about basic payment services in the same way. If we can do that and have that combination, that's the best shot that we have. What do you see as the biggest disruptive threats to smaller banks like yours? You mentioned TransferWise will completely eclipse your remittance business. What other businesses do you see perhaps not existing in a leaner but more focused amalgamated bank in 10 or 15 years? Yeah, technology matters on on everything. Small banks have a a tremendously difficult time investing the capital to be able to invest in good technology. Large financial institutions are going to increase the the distance between them and the smaller financial institutions through the, through these investments. If everybody now for good reasons has come to expect that when they go online or on their phone or use an app that that user experience is going to be friction free, it's going to be great, it's going to be fast. It's not going to make mistakes. There is financial companies. We need to get there. And some companies are not going to be able to make that investment. I, I think that's a, a huge issue. With that investment, though, come some risks that we have to protect ourselves as well. Uh, and that is that is the old bank robbers that you know went into a bank branch with a pistol and a sack of money that they wanted filled up. That's not how you rob the financial system anymore. Now you do it by stealing identities and, and disrupting financial transactions. Not only do you have to have the technology in place to have great customer experience, you got to protect your customers as as, as well. I don't think really small institutions, unless they're incredibly nimble and innovative, are are going to be able to do that. Are you guys thinking at all about digital currencies and how perhaps currencies like Bitcoin could make for a more inclusive financial landscape in the future? 
we're leaving that one up to somebody else to figure out. That's not a pl- that's not a place where we've invested Fair. a lot of technology um, or thinking yet. And I know the world is probably headed towards some form of casualist economy. I think that that's true. Will it be based in his- historic and traditional currencies? Will it be a differently valued currency? I don't know. I think it's fascinating that people are trying to figure out that, but um, that's not something the Amalgamated Bank, at least at this point, is spending a lot of time thinking about. And in the wake of this recent election, upcoming inauguration, what are the three things that are top of mind at your bank? Yeah, I don't know if it's three, but it's certainly one. And I think what we've now done is we've entered an era of unbelievable unpredictability. And while I think there's some euphoria in the immediate wake of the election because people believe that there'll be less regulation and there'll be a tax cut and there'll be some other things, I think some of those things will happen. But I think when we look at how the new administration will act on any number of other issues, we just don't know. I worry a lot about what that level of unpredictability means for the economy. I hope it becomes more predictable and we have a great and growing and burgeoning economy, um, but I do worry about that. Keith, thank you so much for your time on Rice Radio. It's so fun to have you in the studio. It's been great to be here. Hey, listeners, as always, thank you for tuning in. I can't wait to bring you more content on the new technologies that are causing seismic shifts in the world of financial services. Until next time.